Greetings, and welcome to a series of lectures on intermediate algebra, equations, and inequalities in one variable. This lecture focuses on factorizations. Let's talk about factorization and refresh our memory about prime numbers and factoring. Well, the interesting part is you've been doing it for quite a while. And what it is, is if I take something like 3 times 4, that equals 12. 3 times 4 are factors of the product 12. So in the forward direction, I'm multiplying. But if I take 12 and I find components that it's made up of, factors, that is factoring. So let's take a look at the factors of 12. I can do 12 times 1. Now these are the positive numbers. 6 times 2. 4 times 3, 3 times 4, 2 times 6, 1 times 12. And I skipped over 1 because it's very special. 3 times 2 times 2. Now, yes, I know I could say times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1. Okay, I'm not going to worry about that. 3 times 2 times 2. All of these values, all of these numbers are prime numbers. This is 12's prime factorization. 3 times 2 times 2 is 12's prime factorization. Let's get down some terminology. A prime number is any integer greater than 1 whose only positive divisors are two unique numbers, itself and 1. That's it. A prime number is any integer greater than 1 whose only positive divisors are itself and 1. Therefore, 1 is not a prime number. 1 is not a prime number. It's not greater than 1. It is 1, but it's not greater than 1. A factor, also known as a divisor, is a value that divides another value evenly. So let's say a and b represent integers. Then a is said to be a factor or divisor of b if it divides b evenly. That is, there's no remainder. Here's a little list of prime numbers. There are infinitely many prime numbers. 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 31. You should have at least the first 6 or 7 memorized. This will help you out in math a lot uh, when you are trying to factor uh, all kinds of values you want to factor. By knowing at least the first six or seven prime numbers, it will make your life a little easier. All right, so let's factor 60 into its product of prime numbers. Now, how I do it, here are my primes, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and so on. I start with 2. 2 is the easiest one to do deal with, so I do start with 2. So 2 times 30 will get me back up to 60. 2 is prime. Now, is 30 prime? 30 is not prime. I need to break it down. Again, I start all fresh and new, and I look at, does a 2 exist in 30? Yes, it does. 2 times 15 equals 30. And the whole idea is we're breaking down 60, so every now and then I want to check. 2 times 15 is 30. 30 times 2 is 60, and I'm good. I'm still getting back up the tree to 60. 15, is that prime? No not prime, I need to break it down. Is it even? Does a 2 and live, live inside of it? No. So I'm done with all the 2's. And I look at the next prime number, 3. 3 times 5 is 15. And therefore, I can stop there because 5's prime, 3's prime, 2's prime, 2's prime. But I really like all my primes to be on the left, so I just take it one more step. 5 times 1, even though 1 is not prime, I'm not going to break it down anymore. It just gets all of my prime numbers, 2, 2, 3, and 5, all on the left-hand side. So that's what I prefer. I like it all, all on the left-hand side. Okay, so 60 can be written as... 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. This is its prime factorization. If you wanted to write it in exponential form, 
2 squared times 3 times 5. Now you might be wondering, why in the world would I want to go through all that work? Well, when you use prime factorization, you can use it to reduce a fraction. Right now, I have no idea what 210 and 231 have in common. But if I break them down to its prime components, I can see exactly what prime values that they have in common. So let's break down 210. 210 is an even number, so I know 2 lives inside of it. 2 times 105 is 210. Now, 205 is not an even number, but it does end in a 5, so I know a 5 lives inside of it. 5 times 21 is 105. 5 is prime, 21 is not. 21 can be broken down into 3 times 7. Now, 7 is prime. Again, I can stop, but I like all my prime numbers on the left, so I break 7 down into 7 times 1. My prime numbers are 2, 5, 3, and 7. So 210 is 2 times 5 times 3 times 7. Now, I can do the same breakdown of 231. Now, 231 is a little bit harder to see what is inside of it. Number 1, it's not even, so a 2 doesn't live inside of it. It doesn't end in a 0 or 5, so a 5 doesn't live inside of it. But here's a kind of cool little trick you can play. Add the digits of the number. So 2 plus 3 plus 1 is 6. If that added result is divisible by 6, or if, pardon me, if that added result is divisible by 3, then the original number is divisible by 3. So let me work through that. 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 1 is 6. 6 divided by 3 is 2, and therefore I know 231 is divisible by 3. So 231 divided by 3 is 77. 3 times 77 gets me 231. Is 77 prime? No, it's not prime. I can break it down into 7 times 11. Now, again, I can stop there, but I like all my primes on the left, so I am going to break down 11 into 11 times 1. So 231 is, one, is 3 times 7 times 11. What I'm going to do is rewrite 210 in terms of its prime components, 2 times 3 times 5 times 7. 231 into its prime components, 3 times 7 times 11. Whatever is on the, in the numerator... Whatever is on the denominator makes a big fat 1. And 1 times anything doesn't change it, so we can get rid of it. 7 on bottom and 7 on top also make a big fat 1. And therefore, I'm left with 2 times 10 on top and 11 on the bottom. And we don't leave it like this. We do have to do that last little multiplication of 2 times 5. So 210 over 231 will reduce to 10 over 11. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have been able to jump to 10 over 11 immediately. I needed to do my work. I needed to break it down into primes first. Now, factoring numbers is great. We can break it down into its prime components and see what it's composed of. Factoring polynomials sometimes isn't that easy. So we're going to talk about some techniques to be able to factor polynomials. First things first, let's take a look at an example of xc plus yc. I can see that they both have a c in common. I can factor that out, and now I get c times the quantity x plus y. c is a factor, and x plus y is a factor. Just like if I was to break down 12 into 3 times 2 times 2, 3 is a factor, 2 is a factor, 2 is a factor. Okay. That's the same thing as a polynomial. C is a factor, and the whole entire quantity, x plus y, is a factor. It's a little trickier when it's a polynomial. But what if C wasn't just C, but it was another little grouping, A plus B? Now, x times a plus b plus y times a plus b. What do those terms have in common? Well, the a plus b, so I can factor that out. 
And if I factor that out, that would leave x plus y is the second factor. So the first factor, a plus b. Second factor, x plus y. Keep that in mind. Now let's try and factor ax plus bx plus ay plus by. I'm going to group these. I'm going to take a couple of terms and group them together, take a couple more terms and group them together. And in this case, I could have reordered it. I could have said ax plus ay plus bx plus by, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to group it as it's sitting. In the first block of grouping, they have an x in common, so I'm going to factor out the x. In the second group, it has a y in common, so I'm going to factor out the y. Now I'm looking at x times a plus b plus y times a plus b. They both have an a plus b in common, so I'm going to factor that out. And now I have a plus b times x plus y. So factor by grouping really helped me see that it could get down to only two factors, a plus b, x plus y. Factoring trinomials can be pretty tricky. So if we factor some beast of a trinomial like 6a squared plus 7a plus 2, now, if I didn't have that coefficient in front there, if I didn't have that 6, it'd be a lot simpler problem. I'd be basically looking for two numbers that multiply to 2 but add to 7. Okay. That's not a bad thing. When I have this coefficient in front of the uh, first, in, in the first term, it becomes more complex. Because now I'm looking for two sets of factors that that somewhat combination multiplies to 6a squared plus 7a plus 2. Now I'm only going to look at the 6 and the 2. And I take a look at all the factors of 6 and all the factors of 2. Thankfully, 2 is prime. 6 can be 3 times 2, 2 times 3, 6 times 1, and 1 times 6. 2 can be written as 2 times 1, or 1 times 2. Now, what I'm going to do is combinations of the factors of 6 times the combinations of the factors of 2, and I'm looking for the middle term. Okay. So, let's take, where's my highlighter? 6 and 1, and 1 and 2. 6a times 1a, that's the 6 and 1. 1 times 2 is positive 1 times positive 2. Now the reason why I'm doing this is because 6 times 1, 6a times a will guarantee the 6a squared. 1 times 2 will guarantee the third term in our original problem of 2. What I'm looking for is the magic combination in the middle. 6a times 2 is 12a. 1a, 1 times a is 1a. 12a plus 1a is 13a. That is not my combination. Okay, that guy's out. Now, I'm just going to flip and do the, instead of the 1 times 2, I'll do the 2 times 1. I'll keep the 6 and 1 there. So 6a times a is still 6a squared. That's a guarantee. How I set it up, it's got to be that. 2 times 1 is 2. Now, 6a times 1 is 6a. 2 times a is 2a. 6a plus 2a is 8a. That combination is not it. Now, I could switch the 6 and 1 around, but I'm actually going to repeat myself. So I'm going to worry about 3 times 2 and the combination of 1 and 2 and 2 and 1. Okay, 3 will go here, 2 will go here. 1 will go here, have the, the last term of the first 
polyno uh, binomial, and two will be in the last position of the second binomial. 3a times 2a is 6a squared. Again, because it's a factor of the 6, I know it will multiply to 6. 1 times 2 is the 2. 3 times 2 is 6. 1 times, or 3a times 2 is 6. 1 times 2a is 2a, so 6a times uh, plus 2a is 8a. That is not my combination. So i got to go looking for another combination. Let's put the 3 in front, the 2, we'll leave that there, but we'll swap the 2 and the 1. And now 3a times 1 is 3a. 2 times 2a is 4a. 3a times 4, yeah, 3a plus 4a is 7a. There is our magic combination. I have now factored 6a squared plus 7a plus 2. Now that was horrible, right? Do you agree with me? That was a horrible method to use. I've got to figure out where are all these numbers coming from? Where do they all go? This is super confusing. All right, let's use a different method. I'm going to call this the X method. Our original problem is, I wish I had a pin on here. Doesn't look like I do, but let me scroll up and show you what the original problem is. 6A squared plus 7A plus 2. I'm going to take the 6 and multiply it by the 2. And then I'm going to grab the 7 in the middle. I'm going to use that information. 6 times 2 is 12. I know it's an ugly 12. I wish I had a pin. Uh, and uh, the 7 goes here. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to 12 but add to 7. Well, 4 times 3 will get me 12. 4 plus 3 will get me 7. So here's what I'm going to do. That 7a that was in the middle. Oh, this is horrible with the highlighter. Uh, let's get rid of that. You remember the 7a in the middle. I'm going to rewrite it in terms of the 4 and the 3. So I have 6a squared plus 4a plus 3a plus 2. Now I'm going to use grouping to be able to factor this. I'm going to group 6a squared and 4a and 3a plus 2. Just looking at the 6a squared plus 4a, they have a 2a in common, leaving 3a plus 2. Now it's a little trickier, this second one. 3a plus 2, what do they have in common? Hmm, anything? Yes, everything has a 1 in common, so I can factor out a 1. And if I factor out a 1, well, that didn't change anything. I'm still left with a 3a plus 2. And you might be saying, oh, how did that help me? Here's why it helped. Now I have a 2a times 3a plus 2 plus 1 times 3a plus 2. What do they have in common? They have the 3a plus 2 in common. I factor that out. Now I have 3a plus 2 times 2a plus 1. Right. In a previous lecture, we did talk about foiling out squares. So a plus b squared, quantity squared, will be a plus b times a plus b. If you foil that out, that's going to be a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And if you have a minus b quantity squared, we have a minus b times a minus b which would give you a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. If I am giving, given some polynomial in the form that I can rewrite as a squared minus 2ab plus b squared, I can factor it back into a minus b times a minus b, which is a minus b squared. There's one more I want to show you. If you're given the difference of squares, a squared minus b squared, for example, x squared minus 9, then I can immediately jump to the factoring of a minus b times a plus b. Let's give you an example. 16x squared minus 25. Now, it's definitely not the first example. It's not 
a squared a plus b quantity squared. And it's not the second example, a minus b quantity squared, because those are both trinomials when you uh, boil them out. It looks like it's the difference of two squares. So we're going to use this fact to get jump to the factored. 16x squared minus 25x can be written as, well, that's 4 squared times x squared minus 5 squared. 4 squared minus x squared, I can use my exponential rules to write it as 4x quantity squared minus x squared. And because it's in this form of a squared minus b squared, I can immediately jump to the factored, how it's factored. 4x minus 5, 4x plus 5. That was the 4x was being squared, the 5 was being squared, so I can immediately jump to how it's factored. Now we also have setups for the sum of two cubes, like a cubed plus b cubed, and the difference of two cubed, a cubed minus b cubed. But there's really no mm, tricky way of, of telling you how we come about these two factors, a plus b that's one factor. And the other factor is a squared minus b, a b plus b squared. It's just something you're going to have to memorize. But here's how I do it. If I have something like a cubed plus b cubed, the first factor is just ignoring the cubed part. It's a plus b. Now I don't worry about the a cubed plus b cubed anymore. I just look at the first factor, b a plus b. I take the first term and I square it. That's going to be the first term of the polynomial. Then, I, whatever sign this is, I take the opposite of it. Then the second term is just going to be the two terms multiplied together, so a times b. The last term is always positive, and it's going to be the second term squared. The difference of two cubes is exactly the same, except it's a minus b. a squared plus ab is the opposite, plus b squared. Now, there is a long, lengthy way of verifying that this is true. Now, let you pause the video and take a look at it. It's literally multiplying this out and seeing if I get back to a cubed plus b cubed. It's kind of interesting because all the middle terms bounce out of there. They get dropped out. Likewise, with verifying the, uh, the difference of perfect cubes, again, I can verify that it does work, and I get a cubed minus b cubed. But just take a look at it. I'm not asking you to prove it. I'm not asking you to memorize this portion of it. What you do need to memorize is the formula of how to factor it. All right, so let's try it. I have x cubed minus 8 at uh, x cubed minus 8. Now the first thing I need to do is, is this the difference of cubes? Well, the x cubed is really easy to see. Yep, that's cubed. But is 8 something cubed? Yep, it's 2 cubed. Because I have the difference of cubed, now I can jump to my factoring. I ignore the cubes and just say x minus 2. I take the first term, square it, take whatever sign this is and make it the opposite, multiply the two terms together to get this, the middle term, and then the last term, 2 squared. So it's going to be x minus 2 times x squared plus 2x plus 4. I think the one thing that might trick students up is because we had in the squared property, we had 2ab in the middle. This one, we only have ab in the middle. And squaring is different than cubing, so it's just kind of a knowing which one goes with which. All right, so that was a lot of discussion about how to factor a polynomial. But let's lay out some steps that you can rely on for when you are given a polynomial, how the heck are you going to factor it? The first step, every single polynomial, you should look at it and say, is there something I can immediately factor out? Is there a greatest common factor? 
If there is, factor it out and look at the resulting polynomial. If it is a binomial, if it has two terms, then check to see if it's the difference of squares or the sum of cubes or the difference of cubes. So the difference of squares would be a squared minus b squared. The sum of two cubes, which would be a cubed minus b cubed, or pardon me, a cubed plus b cubed. And the difference of cubes is a cubed minus b cubed. Now, if you have something that looks like the sum of two squares, a squared plus b squared, then you're done. Right now, we're not going to factor that. We'll factor it later, you know, when we get a little bit more um, deeper math. But for now, if you see something that looks like a squared plus b squared, you get to stop and say, done, hands up. If it is a trinomial, three terms, then see if it is in the form of a perfect square trinomial. That's the thing that looks like a squared plus or minus 2ab plus b squared. If it's not, then, well, you got to kind of go through either that x method or a grunt method, or if there's no coefficient in front of the squared um, variable, then you can just look at the third variable, say what two numbers multiply to the, to the third term but add to the coefficient of the second term. If there's more than three terms, then try factor by grouping. And then the last check, see if you can factor it any further. So once you factor it once, keep looking to see if you can factor it again and again and again. Because you might not be done just by factoring it once. All right, let's take a, take a look at an example. 2 times x to the fifth minus 8x cubed. Well, it does have a GCF of 2x cubed, so I can factor that out. Now I'm going to look at this, uh, now that I got the GCF out of there, I'm going to look at the remaining polynomial and see what I can do to it. Since it's a binomial, that makes it kind of, you know, it reduces my options of what, how I can factor this. Since the first term is, cute, is squared and the second term is squared, I know it's the difference of squares and I can jump to the factoring of x minus 2 and x plus 2. So the complete factoring of 2x to the fifth minus 8x cubed is going to be 2x cubed times x minus 2 times x plus 2. That doesn't matter if you said x plus 2, x minus 2. It's the same thing. All right, here's a couple more examples. And I just want you to take a look to see how I conquered it. Of course, in both of these examples, I look for the GCF first. And then I look to see, well, is this polynomial in any special form? Well, since it's a trinomial, the first thing I do is see, well, is it a perfect square? Is the first term squared? Is the last term squared? And if I took those square roots and doubled it, would it be the middle term? Okay, x, x squared, the base is x, 3 squared is 9, 3 times x times 2 is 6, so I know this is a perfect square. It fits in that pattern. Again, x squared is x squared, 3 squared is 9, so I take the 3 times the x, I get 3x, and I double it. I get 6x, that's the middle term. So now it's perfect, I know it's the difference of perfect squares. So. I can factor this in x minus 3, x minus 3, and that's x minus 3 squared. Now, if you didn't see that it's a perfect square, that's okay. Find two numbers that multiply to 9 that add to negative 6. You'll still get negative 3, negative 3. For the second example, I went ahead and, and got rid of the factored out the GCF, which is the y, and I'm left with y squared minus 25. Well, y squared is a perfect squared. 25 is a perfect squared. So I have the difference of perfect squares. I can jump to my factoring of y times y minus 5 times y plus 5. All right, let's do a couple more examples. I have 6a squared minus 11a plus 4. Is there a GCF? No. These are not in the form of perfect square because 6 is not a perfect square. Yes, 4 is, but 6 is not. Because of the coefficient in front, I'm going to go ahead and jump to my x method. 
6 times 4 is 24. I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to 24 but add to the negative 11. Well, negative 8 times negative 3 will give me negative, oh, positive 24, but 8 plus negative 3 will give me a negative 11. I'm going to rewrite the negative 11 using the two values I found. Then I'm going to use grouping, factor it, and I have my factors. 2a minus 1, 3a plus, um, minus 4. In the last example, or in this next example, I'm going to find my GCF. The previous one, there was no GCF. There's not always going to be one. This one does have a GCF. It looks like 2x would be my GCF. If I factor that out, that leaves x cubed minus 8. x cubed is a perfect cube. 8 is a perfect cube. So I can jump to my formula of factoring the sum of two cubes x plus 2, remember, take the first term, square it, x squared, take the sign, change it to the opposite sign, two terms multiply together, 2x, and square the second term, and don't forget your GCF. Okay, it never hurts to have a few more examples, especially with factoring, because there's so many options that I could do um, to factor, but I'm always going to follow number one, GCF, and then from there, I'm going to see if I can factor any further. So let's take 2ab to the 5th, uh, 8ab to the 4th, and 2ab cubed. Well, it looks like the GCF is 2ab cubed. If I factor a 2ab cubed out of the first term, I took the 2, I took the a, and I took 3 of the 5b's I'm left with b squared. If I factor out a 2ab cubed of the middle term, I get 4b. Now I factor out the 2, I factor out the a, I factor out the b cubed, what's left? Well, I can't just say nothing. Therefore, it has to be 1 because 2ab cubed times 1 will get me back up to the trinomial that I started with. And now I look at the resulting parentheses and see, can I factor that any further? Are there two numbers that multiply to 1 but add to 4? Nope, I am done. For the next example, I have four terms. Now, if there was a GCF in all four terms, I could pull that out. But it doesn't look like I have, I have um, a GCF for all four terms. So I'm going to try grouping. And I'm just going to group the first two and the, and the second two. Sometimes that works out really well. Sometimes I have to reorganize it or rearrange it. But for this one, I'm just going to go ahead and keep it as is. I'm going to factor out the GCF of the first grouping, and I get 2x times 2x minus 3. I'm going to factor out the GCF of the second grouping, which it looks like they only have an a in common, leaving 2x minus 3. And lo and behold, now I have <coughs> pardon me, 2x times 2x minus 3 plus a times 2x minus 3. They both have a 2x minus 3 in common. I factor that out. So I have 2x minus 3 times 2x plus a. All right, now here's a pretty big problem, and I was going down a different way with it, and I decided, mm, no, I'll, I'll go a different route. So you can see my, my scribble out there in the middle, but that's okay. 2x squared times x minus 3 minus 5x times x minus 3 minus 3 times x minus 3. Now, yes, it looks ugly, but they all have an x minus 3 in common. So let's factor that out and see what's left over. Okay. x minus 3 times 2x squared minus 5x minus 3. Because of the coefficient in the front, I am going to jump to using the x method. Okay. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6, so I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 6 but add to negative 5. Well, negative 6 plus 1 will multiply to a 5. 
So I'm going to rewrite that middle term using these two new numbers. x minus 3 is going along for the right at this point, times 2x squared minus 6x plus 1x minus 3. I can factor out of the first grouping a 2x, leaving x minus 3. Out of the second grouping, again, I can always factor a 1 out, leaving x minus 3. They both have an x minus 3 in common. I factor that out, leaving x minus 3 times the common x minus 3 times 2x plus 1. And since the x minus 3 times x minus 3 is x minus 3 squared, I went ahead and rewrote it as a squaring. That was a big lecture, but that's it for now. So until next time, be seeing you.